Good evening. I'm Henry Stewart. I'm a partner at Watson Farley in London, and I'm also co-head of the global energy sector at Watson Farley. Watson Farley is a global firm, and we have two, over 200 lawyers who participate in the renewable sector and who are involved in transactions and disputes that are relevant to energy transition and to decarbonisation. Today's event follows engaging an engaging discussion with Dieter Helm last month in relation to his new book, Net Zero and How to Combat Climate Change. Today, we're delighted to be speaking with Dame Fiona Wolf. We'll be speaking with Fiona about her experience of electricity restructurings and market implementations in the context of energy transition and net zero. Dame Fiona, I'm sure, is known to most of you. Fiona is an energy and infrastructure lawyer and a former partner with CMS Cameron McKenna. She's known for her leadership of major electricity restructurings and market implementations, having worked in over 40 jurisdictions. She has advised on many of the world's, she, she has advised many of the world's transmission companies and system operators, as well as 28 governments and the World Bank on electricity reforms. She was awarded a CBE in 2002 and a DBE in 2014. She was president of the Law Society in 2006 to 7 and a member of the Competition Commission from 2005 to 2013. Fiona Wolfe was Lord Mayor of London in 2013 and she was also the first Chancellor of the University of Law. Marianne Anton will be leading the discussion on the Watson Farley side. Marianne leads our energy regulatory practice at Watson Farley. She trained at another city firm but subsequently worked at four years, worked for four years at Ofgem, and she's passionate about energy uh, transition. Before we start the session, a bit of housekeeping. First of all, please note that your video and audio have been disabled. Uh, and the second thing to note is that if you'd like to pose a question to Fiona, please use the Q&A function at any time during the presentation. Your questions will only be visible to the presenters. Thank you very much. Henry. Um, Hello, Fiona, I'm delighted to be speaking to you today. Um, we are, we've got a lot of ground to cover um, and we'll see what questions come in. Uh, we'll try to cover as many of them as we can. Um, so I hope you've all poured yourselves uh, a drink, made a cup of tea and um, are ready to um, have this discussion with us. Um, so I guess the first thing that we'll talk about is the energy transition, um, which Henry mentioned. Um, it's starting to pick up speed um, as we race to get to net zero. Um, of course, one of the last major upheavals we had in the in industry in the UK was liberalisation um, 30 years ago. Um, and when we've spoken before, you've described yourself, Fiona, as one of the midwives of liberalisation, um, which is a phrase that I love. Um, what, what is it that you were trying to achieve then? Well, let me start by thanking you for inviting me. I can't say how honoured I am to be the, uh, the filling uh, between uh, the, uh, the amazing Dieter Helm and uh, Lord Deben, who's one of my great heroes. Um, he's probably in my top three. Um, uh, the um, well and Dieter's up there as well so I don't want to <laughs> start on the wrong foot um, so what were we trying to achieve by liberalization do you know I don't think it was a word that we used and we didn't really think about it very much it was back in the the end of the 80s um, we were in the Thatcher privatization years um, we'd been through the privatization of BT and you have to remember what drove that was that was very hard to get a telephone uh, line uh, or, or a telephone repair. Um, and then there was um, British Gas um, when there was a big campaign to widen share ownership. And so we thought, well, you know, privatization, maybe that's just, um, you know, means to an end. This wasn't what we thought it was. It was just an end in itself. Uh, but actually we were introducing competition for the first time, which was a bit of a surprise to um, a, a lot of people uh, one way and another. And so we, we learned the economics of competitive markets pretty quickly um, uh, because it was really designed to put a downward pressure on prices. 
uh, and uh, drive innovation and above all e efficiency. Um, I think that uh, there was a feeling that um, it was creating opportunities for private sector businesses. Not many because the restructuring didn't really uh, divide it into very small investable pieces. So it was more about wider share ownership, I think, um, at that time. Um, but maybe also uh, it was size well be and a, a, a bruising planning inquiry that um, made them realize that actually this is quite an expensive industry in terms of um, uh, the taxpayer and government spend. Thank you. Um, I guess my question, looking at that in context, is um, how how the goalposts have moved since 1990, um, and is is the model we have now, so the output of liberalisation, is it still delivering the success that we need? Yeah, there are two good questions in there. Um, yeah, we had Kyoto in the early 90s, but as you heard from Dieter Helm. Um, uh, we squandered the first 20, 25 years. Uh, I really don't think um, in the work I did in the 90s, I paid attention to that. And uh, it was only towards the end um, uh, as a result of probably um, EU um, pressure, uh, we started looking at renewables. The World Bank at that time was doing reforms all over the globe. And I had, um, <laughs> I had uh, a gold card on three different airlines um uh, and they um uh, they adopted privatization as sort of mantra um if you like um and they i remember them saying that they were astonished that i'd said that privatization was a means to an end um i think they thought it was an end in itself but uh, the um uh we then started talking about the trilemma trilemma of achieving security of supply affordability and decarbonization and we kind of the 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 economists would talk about optimization i remember looking up the word on wikipedia and it seemed to imply that the mathematics would allow you to drop one of the three um, and we soon learned that that wasn't well maybe we took our time to learn that it doesn't really work like that we we, we can't drop any of them um, but um uh is the liberalized model still delivering success well but what, to begin with, it's a bit like weight loss, you know, the, the, the pounds fall off you. And uh, we did achieve some um, massive improvements in efficiency. I remember um, before the vesting of the National Grid and its new company going to Ridgely B uh, to see it respond in the control room of a coal-fired plant, to see it respond to a dispatch instruction. I was pretty much unable, unable to do so. Um, it was completely inflexible um, and had a staff of over 200, I think, at the time, at least in the hundreds. Um, and it then became, um, under uh, private ownership, the most flexible coal-fired plant on the system um, and had a, um, an operational staff of about 15 or 20, I think. Uh, so it just shows what you could do. And the National Grid itself improved its um, congestion management enormously. Um, I remember asking someone at National Control what the cost of congestion was. And he said, I don't know that we know because it doesn't really matter to us what it costs. We just dispatch another plant. I said, well, if they're out of merit, there must be a cost to that. And he said, mm, maybe. Well, four years later, they had under a... a, a fairly simple incentive scheme that Ofgem introduced reduced the, the costs, uh, the annual costs from over 400 million a year to um, under 20. Um, so largely by smart investment and fax devices and live line working and returning to operation. But I think now the question is, uh, is the liberalized model still working and delivering results? It's bedeviled by changing circumstances. Um, it's delivered. Uh, they, there are uh, lots of um, there are lots of rules in competitive markets, and the name of the game is this great stuff for us lawyers. 
uh, not that Watson Farley Williams would do this, but um, uh, advice on ways of gaming gaming the rules, gaming the pool rules in the early days was a was a was a great thing to be uh, to be hired to do. Um, uh, and then uh, there was probably um, yeah there were. We then discovered actually markets are not easy to design. The economists tell you they're badly behaved. I think it's the overlay of the laws of physics one way and another. Um, and since then, I think competitive market outcomes have been developed by, sorry, um, have been bedeviled uh, by um, policy changes or lack of policy decisions, uh, just sheer politics, um, regulatory intervention. It's not easy as a regulator to know how to oversee a market. Um, there's market power and an inertia in changing the rules of the game. Uh, so it, it, it gets harder. But I still believe that it does um, drive uh, innovation and uh, puts a downward pressure on prices as economists had always hoped it would. Following, just following on from that, um, I think you, you've hit on um, hit on an interesting point there about um, inertia to change. Uh, and I guess what I wanted to ask on that front is, um, having worked in um, over forty countries and made the reforms on the reforms that, you, that you've advised on, what is the the one key thing that should always be included, or that that always needs to be thought about well i think i think for me um the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle is is the is the mechanism to pull the the consumers uh the customers um into into the equation um a lot of the competition is focused on the supply the the production side if you like um uh and and um we've got a lot to uh think about in terms of the way in which we um uh we achieve flexibility uh now because of the no the amount of uh lovely renewable generation that we have on the system um we have to think about what we do when it's not a windy day uh and when it's not a um uh, a sunny day um, one way and another so um, you know I mean I think for me the Nirvana is probably clean cheap flexible generation one way and another but but in the meantime we can ask the, uh, the, the the customers to play their part not just the large ones but the little ones so for me um, I think what's missing is some some really good software development to uh, bring them in whether they're 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 aggregated together when they're small or or to capture larger larger players um, and I think we could all benefit from better me better measurement and smart meters Do you know I, I, I arrived home uh, late one afternoon and sustained a call from um, my energy company saying could they fix up a time to put in a smart meter and I said, oh, yes, I can't wait to have a smart meter. Uh, tell me what it does. And so they said, there's a long silence. Uh, he said, well, it means you won't have to be at home when we need to read the meter. So I said, yeah, but um, what about the information that it's going to give me? Um, and um, are, your, um, are we going to have um, time of use tariffs? There was a long silence. Said, I don't know about that. <sighs> But I'd sort of my vision had been that with my smart meter, um, I would um, be able to um, have the information that would come in about prices and my consumption, um, and it would be Bluetooth to all the to little gizmos in all my, all the machinery um, in the kitchen and in the and and the central heating as well, um, and that. Um, uh, I could set the set it all from my an app on my phone, uh, and it would take care of it, it, itself, and I'd be much more energy efficient. 
Um, I think but, that is, um, it's coming. I, I haven't given up hope yet. No, no, that's right. No, I mean, I, no, I, I googled around uh, it uh, uh, only a few hours ago. Um, uh, but, um, but the critics would say it needs to go a lot, uh, a lot deeper and a lot more, uh, a lot more widely. But uh, I think system operations could do with better measurement uh, as well. Um, if I, um, uh, I'm, I discovered, for example, that there are quite a lot of dispatch algorithms around the world that only use the rated capacity of a transmission line. Um, uh, that's the design capacity, which, uh, um, given that we can measure ambient temperatures and the effect on the, the way in which the conductors work, um, uh, that, that seems to be a, a, a missed opportunity. That uh, SCADA systems are on average 5 to 7% inaccurate. Um, but there isn't really, um, there's a big market gap, which a company called, no I suppose I would pronounce it Neuville in uh, Neuville, I think it's American, uh, provides high resolution, big data for grid and asset condition monitoring so that it knows the weather and knows better how to uh, integrate um, renewables into, uh, into the system. Um, and then there's another one I came across, Reactive Technologies, which is kind of the, the first management system for iner grid management system for inertia that discovered there were lots more frequent frequency transients than anybody thought after the great August blackout. Um, and inertia, the cost of inertia, about 100 million to manage it. Um, and they reckon that this would save about 72 million over six years. So, you know, there are all these, all these businesses um, uh, looking, focusing on 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 digitization and better measurement. Um, and uh, uh, we lawyers love things that are, you know, strict and measurable, and sure. that's what we do. But I think it will also it'll help with the trilemma, the security of supply, the renewables integration, and and the affordability. Well, I and think indeed, you, it could um, probably defer spending as well, which has a value too. But I think you've you've echoed a lot of what we spoke about with Dieter as well about taking some personal responsibility and making use of smart meters and the data that's available to us. So um, I think that that will hopefully be coming very soon. Um, and I I admit that I do also hunt around for a time of use tariffs, and I'm eagerly awaiting a smart meter installation. <laughs> But you, you've mentioned a lot of things that the system can do to be much more efficient, uh, which leads me on to um, sort of some big projects that you are currently involved in. Um, the Power Potential Project, the Extending Competition in Transmission Industry Group, and the Offshore Coordination Project. So if you could tell us a bit about these projects, um, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear about what's going on. How long have I got? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we've, we've got about 20 minutes now, but um, I'm sure we can speak all night. We'll, we'll have to have you in for part two. Well, um, Power Potential is one of Ofgem's uh, innovation projects uh, that the uh, ESO is conducting uh, with the UK uh, Power Networks to create a regional market in reactive power in the southeast of England because of the huge load centre uh, and because there is a lot of um, uh, generation which is not synchronous, uh, the interconnectors, for example, offshore wind and the big solar array, it's hard to, to actually support the voltage and manage this. So this is a project to capture uh, distributed energy resources um, and also demand side response um, with so they they can they can both produce um, and consume reactive power to uh, to support both the distribution system and the transmission system. What's exciting about me for me um, is that uh, the, this involves 
uh, transmission distribution working together as if they're one. So the um, distribution company, is, it's, it's also a, it's a transition from a DNO to a DSO mm -hmm. um, that we've been looking at for years, really. Um, uh, so the, the, if you like, the, the DSO goes out shopping for two. Um, and so it, 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 it collects the offers um, and you're looking at some stuff which is quite small scale, some aggregator participation as well. Um, once it's taken what it needs for the distribution system, it passes on uh, what the, what, um, uh, what, what's left for the, the transmission system. Um, and the potential application to any part of the supply chain or any region um, is just huge. Which of course is, is very exciting when we're talking about efficiency because we talk about transmission systems and distribution systems where it's one system, isn't it? It's all connected, but we, we have our, our lovely definitions in the Electricity Act that say at 132 kV it switches over from one into the other. So it's, um, it's good to hear that they're working on addressing the whole, the whole piece together. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your second project, the Extending comp Competition yeah, it's Transition? Called, it's called Early Competition, and I suppose it, uh, uh, it, it drives the, uh, uh, the, the thinking that um, the transmission system, uh, the, the three TOs that we have, the transmission system operators, no, sorry, uh, owners, as they are now, um, uh, are natural monopolies, but they don't necessarily need to be allowed to get larger um, if there is um, uh, another idea, an, an innovative idea, or um, a lower cost in, in the system. And this is not putting out to competition a solution uh, to um, a, a, a need uh, on the transmission system um, once the solution has been identified uh, and designed, it's at an earlier stage. It's not a competition for ideas, that'd be quite hard, um, but it's more a question of saying, here is an indicative solution that the planning process has identified to meet, um, uh, to meet need. Um, and why don't we compete that out um, and see if like my power potential project where i chair the uh, advisory panel um, we get uh, some different ideas and some non-network solutions because non-network solutions might well uh, protect the environment they might enable us to defer investment decisions save us some money could be um, it, it could be helpful in in non-monetary ways so you need some sort of balanced scorecard um, approach to, to, to evaluate them. Um, but my, my role is to look at the in stakeholder engagement with that and chair a, um, uh, the electricity network stakeholder group. Uh, but it's very much about you know, unlocking consumer value and innovation. Um, and the, the ESO is very, con very committed to contributing to the uh, net zero agenda mm -hmm. and would like to be carbon free by 2025. Very ambitious. We'd all like to, um, we'd like to help them along their way. And actually what I was just talking about um, in terms of uh, getting customers and consumers involved is we all have a role to play in my view, uh, one way or another. And you're going to ask me, I suppose, about the offshore coordination. Uh, I am. I am. We have had a wonderful um, career and a, uh, a terrific contribution when you were working off Gem uh, on on that. Um, it's an issue that's been around for a long time. Everybody knows it, which is that um, offshore uh, trans uh, offshore wind has of course grown hugely and the economies of scale that we're now getting make it make it very economic mm. um, and the government has said well you know we've got 10 gigawatts at the moment we'd like 
42 gigawatts by 2030. And you're thinking, ooh, what about the transmission on that? At the moment, um, each, uh, uh, each wind, I'm not going to call it a wind farm. It sounds, it, that sounds rather parochial. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean. Um, power plant. Let's call them power plants. Power plants. Yes, that's right. Um, but uh, they're, 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 they're connected by radial lines. So you've got lots of lines, um, lots of um, substations on the coast, uh, lots of assets. Um, and you're missing out on economies of scale and economies of sizing. And you could download downsize the number of assets that you have to put in place by 50 percent but they reckon that the uh, the cost saving would be in the order of something like six billion um, so um, and they, it's, it's also looking at um, uh, connecting with interconnectors as well um, where that uh, is also um, not happening at the moment but uh, uh, but couldn't should be definitely because I think even even as we exit the EU we will still be connected um, through all the interconnectors so we should be um, making use of, of everything that's available to us um, I think um, it would be great to uh, speak about some of the experiences that you've had um, you've, you've worked all over the globe um, and, and on so many changes and reforms. Um, I think one of, the, one of the points I wanted to come back to is uh, what is the, the one thing that you would, you would advise people they need to include when they look at changing a market? Mm, well, you've used the word change. <laughs> change is the constant. Um, people keep used to say to me in the 90s, surely you've, you've, you've done all these reforms and you've put yourself out of business. Well, it doesn't work like that. So my, the, the, the one thing that I would put in place, uh, because I, I'm bored with people agreeing change is needed, but not actually being able to implement it, is a really effective uh, mechanism for change and one that doesn't get bogged down if in politics um, and vested interests and just sheer fears of the unknown. Um, I'm not, um, I'm not unambitious <laughs> uh, in, in this, but uh, the, um, the thing is that, I mean, there are, there are change mechanisms all, all over the place and we're perhaps not as good at looking beyond our shores for some ideas as we might be but 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 remember that uh, probably a lot of people on this call have spent their lives um, getting their gold cards um, <laughs> working on this stuff um, but um, uh, I can remember um, sitting on the floor at Sudbury House waiting for a decision as to whether we were going to have two pools or one pool back in 89 and thinking, do you know, wait, maybe we could have a change along the way sooner rather than later. So, and maybe this would affect the technical rules as well as the uh, pool rules. So we sat down and literally on the floor and invented something called the grid code review panel. Um, and, and that's used in, 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 in CASC and the balancing settlement code and so on. Um, and um, it, it, it has lots of advantages. I mean, there, you know, nothing is perfect in life, uh, but at least it gets people round the, round, round the table and collaborating uh, one way and another. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, change is a constant in this game. Um, which is very apropos, uh, discussing the energy transition um, <laughs> in a game that's always in transition. Um, I think one of the things that I'd, um, I'd love to hear about, and I'm sure um, that our listeners would love to hear about, are um, some of the memorable experiences that you've had um, working in the energy industry around the world. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear what the most memorable are 
the most memorable for all of the wrong reasons <laughs> and most memorable for all of the right reasons. Um, I'm sure you could regale us with many stories. Well, I think um, uh, you might expect me to, um, uh, to reveal that I worked on the initial reforms in California. Uh, and we were hired because actually I think we were the only law firm that didn't have a conflict of interest in the whole of the United States uh, to um, uh, essentially to, to, to write all the rules that had to be filed with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to make that, uh, that, that new wholesale market work. Um, we were delivered with a huge bundle of papers uh, which we had to, uh, a weekend to climb through. I had 15 people on the task. I decided how to, I was going to project manage this. Um, and we all had to you know, read and compare notes. And we came to the conclusion that we'd just been given a bunch of papers that recorded what was not agreed um, and not what was agreed. Actually, we had a bit of that back in 1989 in the original um, moving up to the, the, the original liberalization here but um, we um, we none of us really were paying attention to what was happening at the state capital and the le and the framework legislation that they were putting through and much to my astonishment I discovered that they had put in place a freeze on what the the big investor owned utilities could charge their customers. And yet they were putting in place a competitive wholesale market with um, three different sub markets and you could game between, between the markets. You could withhold capacity in one market knowing that you could sell it in another part of the market. And Enron were at play at this as well. So you could imagine after a while we thought, we're not enjoying this very much um, and it was uh, also the software didn't didn't really reflect the rules so we're having to rewrite the rules to reflect the software um, so yeah that was a but but probably it wasn't heartwarming um, in the way in which um, uh, the perhaps the most memorable for mm -hmm. For, for the best reasons, if you were going to ask me, allow me to yeah. say, um, was um, so the World Bank um, uh, hired us to work on the reform of the State Electricity Board of ERISA, uh, which was in a parlous state, um, and its, its losses, both technical and non-technical losses, were something around 52%. Um, and it was suffering 28 interruptions a day on average. Uh, and one evening we were in the bar of the hotel and the lights went out as they did. Um, and one of my young people said, oh, I'm bored with this. It would be so nice if the diesel generator would kick in before the interruption rather than after. And I had an engineer from the National Grid who said, that's a very good idea. Nobody should laugh. And so we put in place a scheme to ring up everybody with a diesel generator. Um, well, actually, the, the National Grid had to teach them uh, demand for forecasting a bit better before they could do this and also scheduling of the plant. But once they'd done that, we could, 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 could through a contract, uh, and a little bit of money, um, uh, get everybody with a diesel generator to um, to run their diesel generators when they were telephoned. And it brought the number of interruptions down from 28 in a day on average to eight. Very, very good progress. <laughs> get the demand side into the market. Not that it was a market at that point, but you know, <laughs> get the demand side in. Um, it makes me feel a bit, a bit more grateful that we've only had one outage in living memory that, that we can complain about um, in the last 18 months. Um, well, thank you very much, Fiona. Um, I'm sure that I could keep on asking you for uh, stories all evening, um, but I'm going to move on to um, sort of the final part of our um, 
I'm going to move on in a moment to the final part um, of our questions, but we have had uh, a question come in, uh, which is very interesting. Um, on the basis of your experience um, and discussion of the potential changes, uh, which market do you think is the most interesting one to watch at the moment? Any mm. particular part of the world we should be keeping our eyes on? What um, um, I'm often asked what I what I think is the best market in the world, um, and, and I'm sort of somewhere between Nordpool, but that's kind of easy if you've got lots of hydro. Um, I don't belittle the, the, the sophistication by any manner of means, but um, uh, the um, uh, and and given changes are constant. The other one is uh, is PJM Pennsylvania, New Jersey, mm -hmm. Maryland, uh, simply because of I think for me the sophistication of the market design. Um, I I worked with Bill Hogan on my book on transmission expansion at at Harvard. Um, and he put in place financial transmission rights and uh, a uh, and and uh, I um, the technical rules are very interesting there. They did actually manage to withstand the great um, eastern states blackout in two thousand and fourteen. Um, and there are always things happening. They they have to manage the politics uh, because of a number of different states involved. Uh, and the, the, the multiple transmission owners um, who own generation as well. It's a very mixed sort of market. Um, and some things are always happening there. Um, always so, a lesson to be learned. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I think now we will we'll move on to our, our questions uh, that we've uh, been asking all of our speakers. Um, and the first one is, if you could have a conversation with anyone in history, who would it be and why? And given you've already said that Dieter and Lord Eben are in your top three, I'm expecting it to be either of them. Well, they're living history. <laughs> 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 well, no, I thought it's sort of the obvious was sort of, you know, Faraday or Edison or Westinghouse. Uh, then I thought of... Um, Sally Hunt, who was a great economist at NERA, sadly departed, who, uh, who taught me so much back in uh, between 88 and 90. We were the only two women uh, working um, in the early days in the, in, in the market design. And I thought of David Attenborough, who is living history as well and is such a, a, a marvelous advocate for, uh, for the environment and biodiversity. And I liked uh, Dieter's um, uh, suggestion of William Wordsworth. So I thought about uh, Schubert, who set over 600 poems, uh, most of which, if they're not about love, are about, about the environment and mountains and water. And, um, uh, but I came to the conclusion we needed something um, a little bit more focused on delivery. And so I chose Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who's really the one of the greatest figures of the Industrial Revolution, who really changed the face of the English landscape with his groundbreaking designs uh, and ingenious constructions. And he could turn his hand to anything. And he was he, he worked in lots of different different infrastructure sectors. Um, and a real visionary. Uh, I mean, he did tunnels, he did the Great Western Railway, he did ships, he did the Clifton Suspension Bridge. He saw really basic um, engineering problems that had been lying around the landscape. Um, but, but for me, what he, he got things done and he was a great project manager. And I, we need a few more of those now. Exactly, that's right. Brilliant. Um, well, given, given that we are uh, on the theme of energy, what is it that gives you your energy, Fiona? Yes, I'm, I sometimes wonder. <laughs> I guess that probably if I look around my family, it's, it's, uh, my, my father was an academic and he said 
um, what drives me, he said, is curiosity um, and, a, uh, and a desire to learn and see what works and what doesn't. I have a, have a brother who's a very eminent gastroenterologist who invented the, uh, the very first um, wireless endoscope, which is a sort of capsule you swallow, takes pictures all down your insides. Um, and he likes to be the first to do things. And I guess that I come from that stable uh, one way and another. I like to I like to see if things work. I like to float ideas and see, like Brunel, I could get them implemented. But I think the uh, the other thing that really drives me is I have um, I have four granddaughters, and I really don't want to have to face them if um, they turn around and said, "Granny, what were you doing when you had the opportunity to make a difference?" Um, so yeah, that's that that drives me a lot. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And I guess that moves us to our, our final question, which is um, what does the energy industry look like in 2050? Well, I have to say Dieter makes this very hard because he said nobody knows and anybody who doesn't who says they know um uh won't be telling the truth <laughs> to which the answer is you're out data um as you usually are um and the um uh, as you always are <laughs> um and the um so i can tell you at a high level what i would like um in the in in, in the in the hope that it's achievable. Firstly, I'd like to see all coal-fired generation off the system everywhere. I'd like carbon to be properly priced or taxed. Um, I'd like oil companies diversified and part of the solution. Um, then I'd like that nirvana of cheap, clean, dispatchable, flexible plant uh, for when it's not a windy or a sunny day. Um, I'd like uh, I'd like the demand side. I'd like us all to be in the market, all to be active, all to be able to uh, contribute um, in our own ways. Um, I'd like that 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 measurement and distribution, better better use of of, of resources, um, uh, smart smart use, smart operations, uh, smart consumption. Uh, it'd be nice if somebody could sort out a way of making it easier to put new types of software into old software. I know it's bedeviling Crossrail and it's bedeviled some of the projects I've worked on. But finally, because I often not mouse to work to, to talk on diversity and inclusion, is I'd like to see in the energy industry lots of young people from all sorts of backgrounds, a real diversity of very skilled people, because we do have a skills shortage um, on the low carbon agenda. Um, and these people, I would like them to be able to say, so what is ICE? They've never encountered ICE. Now, you're going to say, what, what do you mean? Now, I'm not referring to frozen water. Uh, which um, uh, it sounds as though I'd be saying I'm, uh, I want people never to have seen ice, quite the reverse, I'd like to see them lot, lots of ice, but I mean the internal combustion engine. Um, that I read a book recently called Melting the Ice, and it's all about how we get, uh, get, get uh, more EVs and hydrogen um, uh, onto, uh, onto our roads. Brilliant. Um... Well, that is an, an exciting feature to look forward to, Fiona, and I, I hope we get there. Um, and thank you for, um, for your time this evening um, and for all that you've done in the industry. Um, you, you've been a great role model for that diversity you've just been speaking about. Uh, and on that note, um, I'm just going to hand over for some final housekeeping points. Thank you very much, Dame Fiona, and thank you, thank you, Marianne, for a very insightful discussion. And Thank you to everyone who's, who's joined. 
um, you'll all receive tomorrow an email asking for feedback on the, on the session. We'd be very grateful if you'd complete that email, um, <clears throat> that feedback um, request. A final thing to note is that the episode three of our series will take place on Wednesday, October 21st. We'll be speaking with John Gummer, um, Lord Deven, who's currently chairman of the, of the Committee on Climate Change and was previously the longest serving UK Secretary of State for Environment. We'll be asking uh, Lord Deben about his work um, on the CCC and his hopes for the direction of policy and action in the UK. Thank you all.